Hello, this is the History Hour, where each week we bring you stories from history told by those who were there. Podcasts from the BBC World Service are supported by advertising. Hello and welcome to the History Hour podcast from the BBC World Service with me, Max Pearson, the past brought to life by those who were there. Coming up, as India and Pakistan commemorate partition, we remember the great poet Rabindranath Tagore. He was a most remarkable figure of a man, with his high headdress, his flowing hair and beard, and his great flashing eyes. Plus, we hear an insider's account of the Turkish invasion of Cyprus in 1974. Military communique number two. It is announced that the Greek armed forces have already replied with their guns to the hideous invader. Also, the dangers of trying to report what was going on in Argentina during military rule. And our reporter gets to the bottom of the nudist craze in communist East Germany. It was never an erotic thing. It was a... A natural thing. Yes. As part of the sort of the German culture of sort of hiking and swimming and... I'd try it. That's all coming up later. But we begin by looking at the harsh realities of global commerce. Going back over thousands of years, each leap forward in transport technology, be it sail ships, ancient roads, steam or jet engines, has led to a consequent expansion of trade. But over the last century, that process has accelerated towards what we now think of as the globalised economy. Some argue that increased trade increases the world's prosperity. But while there may be winners, there are also losers. In the early 1990s, one of the world's best-known brands, Nike, began to attract bad publicity over the working conditions in some of its factories. Fans of the sports retailer started to boycott the company when they found out about the sweatshop conditions in which some trainers were made. Claire Bose has been speaking to an Indonesian Nike worker who was fired for protesting against poor wages and conditions. Yeah, kita bangun pagi. It was very tiring. It was very boring. My job was to glue the sole of the shoe on the trainer. The bosses forced us to do overtime. We were constantly pushed to meet targets. In 1992, Chichi Sukaisi made Nike trainers in Indonesia. She earned less than the minimum wage, less than a dollar a day. Chichi would be at the factory from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week. She was only allowed to leave the conveyor belt for lunch. We didn't have time to have a break. Even if we wanted to take a pee, it wasn't allowed. Some of us would pee under the machine. She says the bosses at the Korean-owned subcontractor where she worked were abusive too. Our supervisor would say, Hi, monkey and use other insulting language. Some women were also sexually abused. The bosses would touch and grab them inappropriately. It was very upsetting and disturbing to see. At the time, Nike made some of the world's most popular shoes, with sales worth $9 billion a year. Its logo commanded people to just do it. Chi-Chi had no idea that the shoes she made could sell for more than $100 a pair. When she found out, she was horrified. I had enough. I was annoyed. I decided to see if any of my friends had the same idea. We agreed to organise a strike. But organising thousands of workers wasn't easy. We had to plan in secret. We first spoke about it during a work outing. It was for a religious festival, so it gave us an excuse to talk to each other freely. Back in 1992, there was no other way to communicate secretly. We had no mobile phones. So I am very proud that we managed to convince all 6,500 workers to strike. 90% of these were women. We all agreed to go on strike. And in September 1992, the workers went on strike for three days. Incredibly, the factory owners agreed to the demand for a rise in salary, but it was small. Only new workers were granted the minimum wage, the equivalent of a dollar and 25 cents a day. Everything went back to normal, but then, one month after the strike, Chi Chi 
was arrested. I was interrogated and accused of involvement in an illegal organization. On the second day, I was afraid of being tortured. I was made to sit in a chair covered with blood and forced to admit to being the mastermind of the strike action. I was terrified. She was released, but two months after this interrogation, Chichi was fired. She was blacklisted by her employment agency and hasn't worked since. But protests like hers were beginning to attract the attention of charities such as Christian Aid. One of the things which Christian Aid is highlighting is the double standards that go on in the shoe training industry. They pointed to the millions of dollars paid by companies like Nike to sports stars such as basketball's Michael Jordan for promoting their products. Particularly when you've got mega celebrities in the sports industry being paid as much as £70 million to endorse some of these uh, shoes for which, say, a woman working in a factory in China would only be paid 25 pence an hour. Nike rebuffed the claims made by Christian Aid and others, saying they were fair to their overseas employees. Our code of conduct says, first of all, that every factory worker has to earn at least the minimum wage, at least. Second, all the factory workers have free housing, they have free transportation, and they work in well-conditioned, ventilated working areas. So we don't have any to, anything to do with the things mentioned in the Christian Aid report. Both workers and manufacturers were just starting to grapple with the impact of globalisation and of relative pay scales. Later, the founder of Nike, Phil Knight, spoke to the BBC about it. Essentially, there are markets in all these things that really kind of dictate what gets paid and what doesn't get paid. If I'd like to average Michael Jordan's salary with a shoemaker in Indonesia, he says Michael Jordan wouldn't like that too good, and we wouldn't have Michael Jordan as an endorsement. And the same time, a shoemaker in Indonesia is paid 50% more at entry level than what he gets at minimum wage you know, in other industries in Indonesia. So what we try to be is good citizens within the country that we're working in. But Chichi Sukaisi didn't recognise that image of Nike as the good citizen. So when, in 1996, an American NGO, Press for Change, invited her to visit America and tell Phil Knight in person, she agreed immediately. I was very proud to be able to go to America. I wanted to speak to the owner of Nike, Phil Knight, to tell him about the low wages for Nike workers in Indonesia. Maybe he didn't know the condition of his workers in Indonesia. Despite travelling to Nike's headquarters in Oregon, she didn't get her audience with Phil Knight. But during her stay in America, Chi-Chi managed to tell her story to thousands of teenagers and students, many of whom then vowed to boycott the company. But that was something she herself struggled with. Sebetulnya saya tidak mau menyuruh menyuarakan boycott Nike. In fact, it was confusing. I didn't want to promote a boycott because that would mean people would stop buying the shoes and the company would close in Indonesia. I worried that it would lead to many unemployed workers in Indonesia. I thought the important thing was to keep the company but make sure they apply the code of conduct which meant paying a decent wage. Code of conduct is to Two years later, in 1998, Nike CEO Phil Knight admitted that his company had become synonymous with slave wages and forced overtime. He announced a programme to address the complaints made against them by allowing monitoring of their factories by NGOs. Millions of Nike trainers are still made in Indonesia. Chichi has never had a job since working for Nike. She lives with her sister's family. She remembers fondly her trip to America, and in particular, the first time she tried on a pair of Nike trainers. I felt proud indeed because after so many years making shoes, finally I could try them on. Proud at that time and sad too. Sadly, I made the shoes for four years and never tried it. I could not afford to buy it. Proud and sad. Chi-Chi Sukaisi was speaking to Claire Bowes, and you can see Chi-Chi campaigning in America in 1996 on our website. Just search for BBC Witness.
It remains a fact that a very high percentage of the shoes and clothes sold in the glitzy high street shops of the richest countries in the world have been stitched together in the factories of some of the poorest. I'm joined now by Lucy Siegel, a journalist and author of To Die For, an investigation of the fashion industry. Um, Lucy, has anything really changed from those days in the 1990s when there seemed to be a growing awareness of the, uh, the sweatshop question? I think a lot has changed superficially. I am not convinced that there have been substantive changes in the supply chain that rule out the abuses that we heard about then and we hear about still. And in many ways, I think the problems in the supply chain have spread throughout different producer countries, what we might call fashion hotspots, garment hotspots. When Chi Chi was um, leading that campaign, we had a slightly different looking fashion industry that has transformed and is even faster, even cheaper and even greedier for market share than it was back in the 90s, if you believe that. But did campaigns like that and the the threat of a boycott, no matter how effective it was, did the threat of a boycott have any impact on the big brands? I think... It obviously caused Nike to change direction. So what we saw was kind of outright denial, hostility and shutting down of campaigners and trying to seize control of the narrative. And as that report makes clear, after a couple of years of that, Phil Knight, who was CEO of the time, came out and said, you, we do have a charge to answer here. And this is how we're fundamentally changing. Now, that was a massive shift and gave a lot of hope to campaigners and concerned citizens because, you know, the issue is that things are very, very complex. But the the move to substantive change has not really happened. The business model has actually grown more fierce and more competitive. And I think we still have a huge amount of problems in the fashion supply chain. I actually wrote my book. My book came out two years before the Rana Plaza catastrophe in Bangladesh. That was in April 2013 when 1,133 people were killed in a single incident making garments for different brands for the Western high street stores than the brands that we all know very, very well. And that, you would think, would mark a seismic shift. It hasn't, actually. And that really is evidence that it's the business model that is really at fault here. But isn't there at least more transparency? It's not as if the world does not know about the potential for sweatshop conditions in some of the developing world. And the responsibility has to some extent be on both the consumers and the big brands to be clear about what they're buying and where that stuff is being made. It is not possible for them to be 100% clear and accurate about where stuff is being made when the supply chain is incredibly chaotic. So I think Nike was actually one of the first brands to publish their list of supplier factories. And you see a lot of brands doing that now. But actually, what tends to happen is that they publish a list of first tier factories that they know about where the, the first order was placed. And what we're still not taking account of are the two, three and four tier factories into which orders are subcontracted where there isn't really anybody watching what's going on. And this is where a lot of these abuses, um, which range, as as your report make, make clear, from sexual abuse of women, intimidation, right through physical abuse and then right through to terrible disasters, as we saw at Rana Plaza. So transparency of first tier factories tells us something, but it doesn't tell us enough. And it isn't fair to expect the consumer to try and unravel all of this before they buy an item of clothing. We know that boycotts damage the people that they're set out to help. Um, We don't want them to boycott. But what else do we want them to do? It's a really, really sticky question. And what about what we might call the the Nike argument in the 1990s, that um, they were paying more than the legal minimum wage in Indonesia at the time, even though that wage might be pitiful by the standards of those who were buying the products? Yes, it's still an argument that's being used today by um, hundreds of other brands all over the world. So that's one that's one aspect that has travelled <laughs> through the decades. The living wage debate over fashion has really been disgracefully slow. 
what we can say is that the fashion industry is is not paying people a living wage and is not providing decent livelihoods within its supply chain still after all of these years. Lucy Siegel, author of To Die For, many thanks.